story is told of a gentleman who was feeling unwell and he goes to see his doctor. And following a battery of tests and scans, the doctor says to him, listen, I'm sorry to tell you, but you need an operation. The cost of the operation is going to be about 14,000 shekels. And I think you need to steal yourself for what lies ahead. The man hearing this naturally decides he wants to consult with his rabbi before he makes such a monumental and significant decision in his life. He goes to his rabbi and the rabbi says to him, I think what you should do is take the 14,000 shekel, which is the cost of the operation, and distribute it to tzedakah. Find needy individuals, institutions, communities, and distribute that 14,000 shekel to those individuals and everything will be all right. Very strange response, seems to be counterintuitive, but obedient as this man was, he does as instructed. He amasses together the 14,000 shekel and immediately sets about distributing those monies to needy individuals. The following week he goes back to his doctor for a checkup and one test after the other, blood tests, scans, x-rays. The doctor calls him in and says, my dear sir, I don't know what to tell you. But that which we saw in all the tests last week, which indicated that it ne we needed to remove it, and you need to go under the surgeon's knife, we can't find any vestige of it whatsoever. And I'm pleased to inform you that you are healthy. You may now go. The man was nat naturally exuberant. And he right away goes to his rabbi to inform his rabbi of the wonderful tidings, the good news, and the miracle which... This rabbi had performed. Upon hearing the story, the rabbi says, My friend, I want you to know there was no miracle over here. But rather what in actual fact transpired is that I recognized that God had determined that you needed to be parted with this 14,000 shekel. And the way that God had orchestrated that this was going to transpire was that you would have to go and have this operation. It would cost you the 14,000 shekel, and that would be taken away from you. And thus, God's divine plan would be realized. So I said to myself, why do it in such a fashion? Why should you have to separate yourself from this 14,000 shekel in a manner which ultimately was going to bring together with it an operation? Therefore, I said, if you take these 14,000 shekels and distribute it to the needy, then God's ultimate plan would indeed be realized. And that's what happened. He gave away the 14,000 shekel. There was no need for God to remove that money from you anymore since you'd already parted with it. And hence, there was no further need for an operation. The story represents... An interesting passage that we find in this week's parasha, the parasha of B'Shalach. Probably the main theme of the parasha is very well known to all of us. The theme of the exodus from Egypt. The Jewish people find themselves at the Sea of Reeds with the Egyptian army galloping towards them. With nowhere to go, they forge ahead at the helm is Nachshon ben Aminadav. He throws himself into the water, and sure enough, they, it splits. We're all familiar with the story. The Jewish people are saved. The Egyptian people, the army is destroyed. And finally, finally, the liberation of our people is complete. And the pathway to receiving the Torah is now almost free. Immediately after that, we find that the nature, perhaps, of the Jewish people, the difficulty with which Moshe Rabbeinu had to deal with a people that sometimes gave him gray hairs, shall we say, comes to the fore. The Jewish people now in the desert find some water in a place called Mara. The word Mara means bitter, and it receives its name from the fact that the water itself was indeed bitter. They naturally come to Moshe Rabbeinu with a complaint. Why have you brought us here? You've given us this water that's going to be our end. 
And Moshe seeks instruction from God and he receives it. By way of an order to take a stick, to cast the stick into the water, and that stick will miraculously, will miraculously sweeten these bitter waters. But what is most odd about this particular directive is not simply the taking of a stick and casting it into the water, and somehow miraculously it will transform the bitter waters into sweet, but the nature of the stick. The Torah tells us that the stick itself was bitter and was cast into the bitter waters to make it sweet. It seems very counterintuitive. It's almost like saying when a person is confronted by, by a very bitter drink, you say, well, you know what, don't put in any sugar, don't put any honey. What I suggest is take some lemon juice to sweeten it up. It seems to be counterintuitive. But indeed, that's exactly what happens. This bitter stick is cast into the water and miraculously. Water is changed from being bitter into something sweet. Ahmad did these comments and he says that most of the times when we have these counterintuitive phenomena, we think it's inexplicable. The truth be told, it's only inexplicable because we don't understand it. Perhaps we cannot explain aptly why it is that a magnet is able to attract metals. What's the power? What's the force? What's the nature of this? That it's able to draw to it metals and not other substances. But the truth is that this is no less of a miracle, or no more of a miracle. It simply is perhaps a deficiency in our knowledge and our understanding. But in actual fact, what appears to us as miraculous is really only part of the norm with which God created the world. And so to over here, the oddity of taking a bitter stick and casting it into bitter water and transforming it into sweet appears to us to be counterintuitive and miraculous when in truth it's only the way that God really intended it to be. But that God's intellect is far superior and beyond ours that we not, cannot comprehend it. And I think the same thing can be said also with regards to mitzvot. Many of us probably feel that leading a life that is in accordance with Jewish traditions, the laws of kashrut, the laws of Shabbat, and so on and so forth, is not liberating, but rather restricting. It seems counterintuitive to suggest that if I cannot eat anywhere that I desire, if I cannot do anything that I want on any given day that I want, then I'm restricting my life. Whereas in actual fact, the Torah tells us that the true liberation of the Jew is when his soul is able to express his self or herself in the manner in accordance with our Holy Torah. In the keeping of kosher, it's not a restriction, but rather it liberates our soul. It liberates our being. It makes us truly free because we're able to express our true identity. This is why the Torah continues and says, if you shall hearken to the voice of God, and you will hearken and heed to His commandments, and you will keep all of His statutes, and then you will realize that all the maladies which I placed upon Egypt, I shall not place upon you. It seems counterintuitive. How can that be? The more I restrict myself, the more free I become, the more protected I become. And the answer is yes. Whilst perhaps we might not understand it, the truth be told, it is very real. Whilst we might not understand why giving 14,000 shekels to Tzedakah is the solution to the physical ills of this individual, the truth be told, it's only our lack of comprehension which makes it difficult to relate to that idea. But the factuality of it, the reality of it, is unquestionable. Therefore, we as Jews have to realize that if we truly want to feel the liberation, the liberation of our people, the liberation of ourselves, the liberation of our souls, it's not by being able to do whatever we want, but it's by 
agreeing to do what God wants from us. Then, then we truly will have a healthy soul. Then we are truly liberated. Thank you for taking the time to listen. I wish all of you a good Shabbos. Please God, may we find a way of reconnecting. Reconnecting to our heritage, to our responsibilities and our commitments. And strengthening ourselves and achieving true personal spiritual liberation.